Hey there, everybody. Good morning. It is Wednesday, the 24th of November, 2021, 10 o'clock in the morning. And we're here in the book of Zechariah. In fact, we're finishing Zechariah today with chapter number 14. So turn your Bibles there with me. Get those books out. Open them up. Let's read together. Uh, find Matthew and then back up past Malachi. The very next thing you'll find is Zechariah 14. So we have covered this book for the last two weeks. And what we have discovered is it's primarily broken down into two different sections. Now, remember, it is a captivity era book. It is toward the end of the captivity when the people are going to be released and sent back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and the nation eventually. And so the contemporaries are Daniel, Esther, Mordecai, Haggai, Zechariah, Nehemiah, and Ezra, Zerubbabel, Joshua, the son of Zedekiah. Those are the ones. So, uh, here we are. The first half are some really unusual, abstract visions and dreams that God gives to Zechariah. They're primarily broken down into eight different chapters, and that's why we say there are eight of them, but some of them, you know how a dream can, can metamorphose from one thought to the next, and it sort of goes like that. Women with stork wings carrying other women in baskets, <laughs> flying around with them. Very unusual things there. And what those visions generally talk about, they go back and forth between what God's people have done in rebelling against him in the past, what he's willing to offer for them if they're willing to follow him again and be obedient, uh, or what will happen if they don't decide to do that. So that's the whole first half of the chapter, which really turns out to be what we find here at the end. So chapters nine, uh, 8, 9 through 14, they're going to discuss uh, whether or not God's people are worthy for the kingdom that he's promising to bring back to them. So let's pray and we'll read chapter 14 and you'll see here the battle of Armageddon. You'll see the uh, millennial kingdom, the new Jerusalem even ushered in. Father, we pray your blessing on our reading and study. Give us wisdom from it, we ask. We need your help. We need your spirit's guidance. We pray that you'd give him to us today. Please give us the mind of Christ as we read and understand. We do have frail and faulty minds and intellect. We don't always understand what you're trying to get through to us. So we pray that you'd make it simple and make it plain. We love you and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, Zechariah chapter number 14, verse number one. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the west, I'm sorry, toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark. But it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night. But it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. 
So there we've got the Battle of Armageddon, the Tribulation period, Armageddon, and the establishment of the Millennial Kingdom. Now, the city being ravished and uh, the spoil being divided, that's all Tribulation period, running up into the mountains. If you've read about the, the area of Petra, where there are uh, it's supposed Israelites will flee to during this time. Uh, there are Bibles hidden up in those mountains. There have been Christians who have put those Bibles in place there for the Jews that may find them someday. And so they're going to flee, but then the Lord will come with his saints. That's the second coming of Jesus, where he'll come for the battle of Armageddon to defeat all the nations that are there will be there with him, and then he will establish his kingdom. There will be no night there, uh, just as we read in Revelation chapter 21, living waters in verse number eight, we're told, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Verse number 10, and the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem, and it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate unto the place of the first gate, unto the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananiel, unto the king's winepress, and men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them. And they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance." And so shall be the plague of the horse, of the mule, of the camel, and of the ass, and of all the beasts that shall be in these tents as this plague. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king. Capital K there, meaning, of course, the Lord Jesus, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. You know, there's something interesting that, that we don't talk about often concerning the millennial reign of Christ. We fail to consider that there will continue to be people born who decide to reject the Lord. The human race does not have an end. If you read the book of Isaiah, it says of the increase of his kingdom, there shall be no end. And if you read Revelation 21, you've got the new Jerusalem uh, there being talked about in the new earth. And then you get to Revelation 21.8, it says, but the fearful and the unbelieving, and the abominable and murderers and sorcerers and whoremongers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. This is a second death. Well, a lot of people try to take that verse and they act as though it, it's out of place. They act as though it doesn't belong there. Well, why would you put it there then if you're God? Why would you say new Jerusalem, new earth, but the fearful and the unbelieving? Here's the thing. Not everyone is is going to decide. God has always given man free will. And there'll never be a time when there's not a human nature that causes men to decide they don't want to seek after God and they only want to seek after themselves. And so the lake of fire is that uh, person's destination ultimately. But if you go to the tribulation period, and the battle of Armageddon, not everybody dies during the battle of Armageddon. And I, I don't know if we just assume that or believe it, but they don't. Uh, there will be babies born during the tribulation period who will get saved and turn to Christ. But those people who don't die during the battle of Armageddon, they will carry on into 
the millennial reign of Christ. And they're going to form nations, and they'll still be nations. Although Jesus will rule the whole world, um, there will still be these nations. And they're going to be told to come to Jerusalem and to offer the feast of the tabernacles. Uh, verse 18, it says that. But if they don't, then they'll be judged. They'll be punished. God will bring no rain for their crops. There'll be plagues within uh, their people. This is the Lord ruling. You know, if you've got a perfect society, there's no need for a ruler. And so Jesus will be there. Uh, and he will be ruling and reigning. You and I will be in our glorified bodies. We will be ruling and reigning with him uh, throughout the earth. Verse 19. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the feast of the tabernacles. In that day there uh, shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and see therein. And in that day there shall be no more Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. So no more heathen, no more pagan. Now, let's talk about what this book is, is telling us in summary. It's very simple thought, but it's very necessary. That you know, John F. Kennedy, we may have mentioned this a couple days ago, he made this statement: ask not what your country can do for you but ask what you can do for your country. That's sort of the idea of the book of Zechariah here. You know, quit asking what God can do for you and start asking what you can do for God. More specifically, let's put it this way. Stop asking when God's kingdom is going to come to you and start asking yourself, are you the kind of Christian that deserves for God's kingdom to come. That's what this whole book is talking about. As God talks with his people, and remember, he is talking to the Israelite people here, the nation of Israel, this is their, their deal with God. They need to step up who they are so that they're worthy of what God wants to do rather than reject him, live contrary to him, walk in disobedience. If that's what they want to do, there's no point in his kingdom coming because they don't want it anyway in reality. And so what he's doing is he's giving the book of Zechariah to the people so that they can sit and think about it. Because really, there's not a lot of conclusion here to this book, is there? It's just a lot of back and forth, abstract thought, nothing linear here in the timeline. It is all over the place just to get the people thinking, hey, you know what? We want so much for God to come. Well, if we want him to come so badly, why don't we want him in our lives now? You know, if we don't want him now, why would we want him present in our lives? We don't want his book. We don't want prayer. We don't want church. We don't want soul winning. We don't want service to God. Well, if you don't want that, what makes you think you're going to want heaven? You don't want to be with God now. Why would you want him to come and establish this, this rule on earth? And so that's the question that's, that's being posed here. And I guess it's a pretty good question for us to answer too, isn't it? You know, if you don't want God in your life now, which I don't think you're necessarily part of that group because you're watching a devotion every single day and learning from the Bible and reading and studying. Uh, but, but for those who don't really want God to interfere in their lives, why would they be interested in being with him for eternity or seeing him establish his rule and reign on this planet? So that's the book. That's Zechariah. Hopefully we made some kind of sense out of it for you. These minor prophet books can be a challenge. Those major prophet books can be a challenge. Sometimes it all can be a bit of a challenge, can't it? But thanks for watching this morning. We wrapped it up. Tomorrow morning, uh, 10 a.m., we're going to start the book of Galatians. We've got six days until 
the 1st of December, and I wanted to start Matthew on December 1, and so the we need a six-chapter book, and we've only got one of them left, and it's Galatians. So we're going to tackle Galatians, a very good book concerning salvation, salvation by grace, through faith, not of works, not through keeping the law. Uh, if you're worried about your salvation, you're confused about it, it's going to help you a lot to nail some things down. So I'll leave you alone with that. As always, please like, love, and share the post. And uh, hopefully we'll see you tomorrow morning. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. I don't know if you're off already from work, but uh, hopefully you'll have at least a day or two to get some rest and and uh, be able to recharge the batteries a bit. Thanks for watching. God bless you. Have a great day. Church tonight at Lighthouse. Teachers meeting at 6 and service at 7. Hope you'll join us. Have a great day.